I grew up uh, in northern Wisconsin on a, a small road with, with six houses. Uh, they're actually duplexes, so 12 families. Um, I, can, I can probably, uh, without much thought actually, name off uh, all of the families that live down the street. Uh, you know, the, the, the kids in the house and, and the parents, you know, first and last name, Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so. Um, very small uh, community uh, in rural Wisconsin. Um, on my average Saturday, things like that, I'd wake up in the morning and, and, uh, and get a, a pen and paper out and I'd, I'd write down the names of, of the kids in the, in, on the street who I'm going to try to call and see if they can you know, come play football in the backyard or, or just get together and hang out that Saturday. And, and uh, you know, so I pick up the, uh, uh, the, the rotary phone and, and you know, call and, you know, hey, Mrs. Heron, uh, can, can Trent come out? And, and uh, hey, Mrs. Hairgrove, you know, uh, can can Jonathan come out and and uh, just calling around to, to uh, you know the kids in the community and so we'd play and 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 uh, you know out in the fields we'd play and and uh, you know it wouldn't take much for for uh, a mom or dad to you know hey you guys you're being too rough out there you need to stop that or hey don't don't go by the bushes or you know stay over here and and everybody in the on the street just you know one of the parents was speaking so we so we listened up. Um, in the evenings, a lot of times we had a basketball hoop in our yard and, and uh, in our driveway. In the evenings, a lot of times kids would come over and we'd, we'd play under the lights on the, the driveway. And, and uh, a number of times my mom or dad would walk out into our, our garage and, and there would be some kids from the community uh, from the street, you know, going through our, our refrigerator getting drinks. Um, it was just a, a, a smaller, uh, tighter knit uh, community than probably what most of us experience uh, today, even in our uh, township here, uh, with things spread out a little bit, it's 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 probably uh, though uh, affected our relationships uh, with with one another. Um, certainly, technology um, has has kind of uh, attacked that that community feel uh, that a lot of neighborhoods can bring, where where people can kind of be independent and on their own, and and kids can talk to kids without talking through mom and dad, and out without getting to know them and building those relationships and. And that's, that's nothing good or bad about technology. Um, it's, it's great, I love the fact that my, my parents in Georgia can, can see their grandkids uh, really at a moment's notice through FaceTime. Um, but, but no doubt, technology has pecked away uh, at, our, uh, at the depth and the quality of our relationships. Um, and, and I really think that's where hospitality kind of comes into play and, and, and opens the door uh, for building deeper relationships. The, the author says it like this in the book. Um, in a culture where busyness is prized, where isolation is rampant, and where blinking devices replace genuine relationships, hospitality offers a beautiful and countercultural rebellion. Our passages this week are found in the book of Acts, uh, in Acts 2 and in Acts 4, uh, very familiar passages. Uh, but what's interesting is how uh, this new community of faith, uh, begins building uh, this radical uh, hospitality. Acts 2.46 uh, reads, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts. That's interesting uh, how, how that's worded. They received their food with gladness, with thankfulness. We're, we're familiar with that. Uh, but with gladness and with generous hearts, there's a, 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 a hospitality to how they, they share. They, they, they had all things in common. Uh, they were giving with one another. They were open with one another, giving and receiving. It's a very interesting community. In Acts 4, it reads, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Once again, picture just you know, scripture just paints for us this picture of of this community that that every everything um, that that somebody had they, they didn't think of it as belonging to them. They realized it was something that God had given them that they could now use to fulfill God's calling in their life. Now these two passages and acts kind of give us a a picture of of what the community of faith is supposed to be like. But I actually think as we consider um, the mission that Christ has called us to, to, to make disciples of all nations. I actually think that this picture of hospitality extends beyond the church community and can have a profound impact 
uh, out in the world as we relate to those outside of the faith. The author says it this way. When many people in our culture think about Christianity, they reach their conclusions based off of pop culture or preconceived notions or Christians depicted as caricatures on TV shows or in other entertainment. But how might their views change if they shared a meal with a Christian this week? When faced with genuine kindness and warmth of a real person, would they consider rethinking their previously held assumptions? Yes, the community of faith is supposed to have this commonness and this kindness and this generosity with one another. But what if the community of faith extended that generosity and extended that kindness and that warmth to a world that stands skeptically looking on? Listen to this interview from uh, Rosaria Butterfield as she she tells her, gives her testimony um, as, uh, as, as how biblical hospitality was extended to her. And, and I'd encourage you to, to pick up a copy of her book um, that's called The Gospel Comes with the House Key. You'll hear from her testimony just a little bit of how hospitality uh, changed her life. We live at this time where so many Christian ideas are understood as hate speech. After the Obergefell decision legalized gay marriage, that put the gospel on a collision course with the new law of the land. And I think many Christians have been struggling with, well, how do I speak? What do I do? How do I move forward? Home is a vital place to invite your neighbors in to have some heartfelt conversations. We can love our children together. We can let some things slide, even though the world we live in would say that we're supposed to be enemies. To me, hospitality is the ground zero of the Christian faith. I was raised in an Italian family. There were some issues in my house that made it almost impossible to have people in. So hospitality didn't really become endemic to my life until I had set up a home of my own. I was a professor at Syracuse. I lived as an out lesbian feminist in New York. In our LGBTQ community, somebody's home was open every night of the week. And there was never a question, where will I go? if I need help, because the community itself is organic and fluid, and that was how we dealt with crises. After I wrote my tenure book, I really wanted to write a book that was on my heart. Why is the religious right such a hateful community? And why do they hate people like me? I was on a war against two things, patriarchy and stupid. So I was really curious to know why relatively decent people would use the Bible in such a hateful way. So I wrote an editorial and it brought all kinds of attention my way, which I didn't really expect. But one of the things it brought my way was a letter from Ken Smith, the pastor of the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. When Ken and his wife Floyd invited me to dinner, I I was happy. I, th I thought of Ken as my unpaid research assistant. And they were fine with the fact that I, I wanted to read the Bible to critique it. That began a research journey that changed my life. But it wasn't research that changed my life. In Ken and Floyd's home, the way that they practiced hospitality became a living, breathing example of the theology that they were teaching. After my first dinner at Ken and Floyd's house, Ken gave me a big hug, Floyd gave me a big hug and a kiss on the cheek. We said, we'll catch up next week. This was fun, can't wait to do it again. They did not share the gospel with me and they did not invite me to church. And that was so wonderful because what it showed to me was that they didn't see me as a project. They actually saw me as a neighbor. Now, I didn't step foot in the church for two years, but every week I was in their home, 
And every week, it was clear that pretty much anything could go. We could ask anything, Ken and Floyd were fine. And that process of dialogue and table fellowship was compelling. It was deeply compelling. I did not come to faith because I stopped feeling like a lesbian. It's not that I got all of my worldview issues just completely cemented with a happy Christian evangelism, not at all. I came to faith because I became convicted that Jesus is who he says he is. Ephesians 4.29 is our watchword, that we are to impart grace to the hearer. I might not agree with everything that you hold to be near and dear, but because we are neighbors, I don't have to say everything that's on my heart. And you don't have to say everything that's on your heart right now. We can put some of our worldview issues aside. And over years of this, the gospel takes on a momentum that is compelling to people. I think we need to give each other the reminder that it's God who saves. It's not about certainly us being perfect or our words being perfect, but show up we must in the lives of unbelievers. What comes naturally to me and what comes naturally to you is to hang out with people who are like us, <laughs> people who can maybe finish our sentences, people who don't scare us. But hospitality, biblically speaking, takes strangers and makes them neighbors, and takes neighbors and makes them family of God. It's a great joy to see the gospel bring people together who are supposed to be enemies. And it's a great joy to know that God never gets the address wrong. And if your neighbors aren't people you know yet, there's a blessing waiting for you. As Rosaria shared her testimony um, of just the kindness of this, this pastor and his wife, this generosity, this hospitality, uh, I'm reminded of Paul's words uh, in 1 Thessalonians 2, where he talks about his love, his compassion, his care for the Thessalonians. He says it this way, But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. I love that statement in verse 8, where Paul says, I was eager not only to share the gospel with you, but also ourselves. What if the world knew Christians as people who didn't simply share the gospel with them, who didn't simply pass out a tract or share a five-point outline or ask some diagnostic questions. But what if the world knew Christians to be people who shared the gospel, but also shared their whole lives? Would that change their perspective of Christians? And as Christians, what if in doing so, as Paul says in this passage, what if in doing so these people became very dear to us, from strangers to friends, from those outside of the family of faith to those inside the family of faith. That is the call of biblical hospitality.